Hey there, and welcome to a very special episode of The Rachel Pontillo Show. I'm your host, Rachel Pontillo, and my guest today is Melissa Gallico. Melissa is the author of a fantastic book that I think everyone should read, and it's called The Hidden Cause of Acne, How Toxic Water is Affecting Your Health and What You Can Do About It. Here it is. Melissa actually has a really interesting background. She's a former military intelligence officer, Fulbright scholar, and intelligence specialist at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. She's instructed classes for FBI analysts at Quantico, graduated with honors from Georgetown University, and holds a master's degree from University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Now you might be wondering why someone like Melissa with her background would write a book about acne and I'm here to tell you that she has plenty of reason and she has done a ton of fantastic research and you are really going to enjoy this interview. So I am so excited to introduce you to Melissa Gallico. Hi, Melissa. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to speak with you and share your message with our audience. Thanks so much for having me, Rachel. So Melissa and I actually had the opportunity to participate in a town hall meeting that was hosted by JJ Virgin, but that was kind of a back and forth discussion between Dr. Mark Hyman and Congressman Tim Ryan, who is out of Ohio. And the conversation was generally around food safety and the food system and food politics and all of that and what the problem is and what this congressman wants to do. And it was really heartwarming for all of us in the audience to see. And then at the end that we did have the opportunity to stand up and go to the microphone and ask questions. And um, Melissa was one of those people who took the mic and she pretty much, it was like a mic drop, jaw drop moment where she just, she was prepared. And uh, Melissa, why don't you just give an overview of what you what you said, and then we'll kind of go into what we're talking about today, if you would. Sure. Well, I did a little bit of research beforehand just to see what his position is on my issue, which is public water fluoridation. So I just, you know, Googled some of, um, some of the history, and I saw that he had signed a resolution back in 2015, which a lot of congressmen signed, um, and congresswomen, um, declaring that fluoride is one of the greatest public health achievements of the 20th century, this artificial water fluoridation program. And I will probably get into this, but I discovered that it is, isn't so great for me. It really um, gives me a pretty immediate reaction whenever I consume foods or beverages that are high in fluoride, I get a skin reaction of acne, cystic acne, like painful, ugly, like just really um, unpleasant <laughs> condition to have. Um, so I asked him, um, you know, what would it take to change your position? And I knew that Dr. Hyman, who was sitting right there hosting um, the discussion, also speaks out about the dangers of fluoride and how, you know, it's not completely safe um, for everyone. Like um, the government dentists will, will say, you know, it's completely safe for everyone, no matter how much you consume. Um, but certain people like me and a lot of others, which is what I'm learning, are very hypersensitive to it. So um, I, I told him about my experience and how I figured out that my acne was caused by fluoride and I told him about some other people that I've spoken to uh, just the day before at the airport at the layover on my way to San Diego. I talked to a woman on the phone whose son is autistic and he's very sensitive to chemicals and he can't even shower in fluoridated water um, wow. without ending up in pain. He gets headaches, his heart starts racing, he turns red and, and it's just really traumatic. And if he eats it in food, like there's certain food items that are really high in fluoride because it's a common pesticide. Mm. Um, have the same reaction and it can be really dramatic and, and painful for him. So when I told uh, Congressman Ryan about that, he was just like, I had no idea. I didn't know. And, and that's what I said. I don't blame you for voting for this resolution because the, all the information that you're getting from the official agencies is that fluoride's great. It's completely safe. It's really been amazing at reducing cavities and everybody's happy with it. But there is a very important other side of the story I wanted to get across. So he had a great answer and he's like, I said, what will it take to change your mind? And he said, you're already doing it right now. This is how things change by sharing our stories. And he asked me to get with his staff and um, put together an overview and he would start looking into it. So I was really encouraged by that. And you've started doing that, which is fantastic. So I'm, I'm so excited 
for what you did there. That was to me, one of the standout moments of the entire summit that we attended. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you for just standing up and for being so passionate, but also for coming prepared. You really were impactful. And as um, I, I've already shared with the Nutritional Aesthetics Alliance audience, the recording from that town hall meeting. So if you guys are watching and listening, you may have already seen uh, Melissa's question. And if you haven't, go and go and look at that. And I'll put the link um, in the show notes for that too. So you guys can check that out. It was Great, fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. But um, it, it, it's, it's something that the, the overall message was we have to do more than vote when we care about something. We do have to speak up. We do have to get involved. But when we do so, coming from a position of education um, and having some sort of evidence with you and, and having a prepared position is so much more effective than just grabbing a mic and, ah, 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 you know, which people tend to do when they're emotional and passionate about something. But it's more effective and people will listen more if it's a more thought out presentation, that's exactly what you did. So kudos to you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we are not just here to talk about that today. We're here to talk about your book and also this work that you're doing on the connection between fluoride and acne and just the just fluoride in general. Um, but you're, you have two books. Your, your newer book is The Hidden Cause of Acne, How Toxic Water is Affecting Your Health and What You Can Do About It. And then you're, you have another book called F is for Fluoride, a feasible fairy tale for free thinkers 15 and up. <laughs> oh my God. I love, I mean, who doesn't love a good alliteration, right? <laughs> so let's, I, I really want to just kind of go back to the beginning here and ask you, how did you even come to this? So you struggled with acne, as you mentioned, but you eventually came to the conclusion that for you, the main root cause was fluoride. So what was it that really shed light on that for you in your own experience? Well, it was a long story, so I'll try to keep it short because I had acne for about 20 years, you know, pretty much off and on, but it was whenever I lived in the United States. And I mentioned this in my question to the congressman is I, my background is as a national security analyst. I've been an analyst for the government. I was in the military for five years and then I went straight to the FBI. So I'm focused, I've always been focused on science and technology issues, but not quite <laughs> in this way. Um, but I lived abroad a lot and whether I was in Africa or Europe or the Caribbean, I noticed that my skin cleared up and I just, I wouldn't have to do anything about it. I would just have, I'd just be one of those people that has naturally clear skin. And then when I lived in the States, whether it was Rhode Island or Virginia or DC or Florida, I had really bad acne and some places were worse than others. And I started figuring out that it was something in the water because I could get to a new location and wash my face and right away I would know is this going to be one of those places because certain water supplies like just felt uncomfortable on my skin I felt like it left like a sheen on my face after I washed it like I wasn't getting clean I was aggravating my skin by washing it and so very early on I started using bottled water to wash my face it didn't completely fix the problem but it felt better and I didn't even think until a decade later in my mid thirties when I was still struggling with cystic acne, if it could be fluoride, you know, I originally thought maybe lead, uh, maybe copper. And then I knew topical applications of fluoride could cause acne, like in your toothpaste and things like that. So I, I had switched to a non fluoridated toothpaste. Um, and then I had the idea, what, what about drinking it? You know, it's in the water. Is it, somehow affecting my skin just by drinking fluoride. So I cut it out of my water and right away I saw a really big difference. Didn't completely go away, but it was so much better. And at this point I had cystic acne on my chin is, is the main part, but then it would spread. I'd have it on my forehead, mm. down my neck, the front and back of my neck, wow. even in my ears. Sometimes I would get those little cystic painful oh like tender lumps and it was so I saw a major improvement when I started drinking non-fluoridated water. And then I would get a few flare-ups and I would look at the literature on fluoride and see, you know, you know, oh, chicken bones are a really high source of fluoride because just like with us, it accumulates in their bones and then we make soup out of it or we make chicken nuggets and little right. scraps of bone get into the finished product and it's really high on fluoride. So I... I was like, oh, okay, let me cut that out of my diet. And it, and it just kept getting better and better until 
I was able to live in the United States and not have cystic acne. And I was so happy. Um, and I had started blogging about it a little bit, like when I was trying to figure it out and people would help me like, oh, look into this or this food has fluoride. And, and that really helped me figure it out. And during that time, it was a very little blog. And somehow I connected with all of these people who were like, oh, I healed my acne too, <laughs> like by avoiding fluoride. And I was like, I thought this was a really rare, weird allergy that I had. Um, but I started thinking, actually, this is pretty common. Yeah. And so when I sat down to write the book, I, I had written like a free PDF and just put it on there. Like, here's how I heal my acne by avoiding fluoride. And um, this woman wrote to me and she's like, your book, your book say uh, saved my life. And I was just like, Oh my gosh, it's not even a real book. It's a PDF. You know, I need to write a real book and put it on Amazon. Um, so that's where the book came from. And I really dove into the literature for that. And when I looked at the literature on acne, I was just shocked at how few studies dealt with diet. I think Johns Hopkins university did a study around the turn of the century. And they looked at like the last 50 years of acne research. And they found that in over 99% of the cases, they didn't even mention diet, let alone actually study diet. I know. So the, when the I went back and I looked. Just so antiquated. I know. I couldn't believe it. I thought, I thought I would think dermatologists thought they were all over this. And, you know, but they were really focused because the funding was, you know, on finding a pill or a cream or something like that. So that's what they were focused on because they need funding to do their research. And it's gotten a little bit better since then. There's more studies on dairy and there's more studies on sugar with yeah. the paleo movement, but no one is looking at fluoride. So um, there are some allergists who have published about it, fluoride and acne, but there's not a lot in the literature. So I wrote the book, putting my whole theory out there. You know, it's obviously not a science. I haven't done clinical research, but I, as an analyst, I, I put together my theory, you know, my intelligence assessment and put it out there. And I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to connect with other people. You know, when I see a review come on, on Amazon, especially from someone who healed their acne, I'm like, yes, I get so excited. So I'm really excited to get it out there. It's amazing. So, okay, we talked about skin and we talked about how people in general, a lot of people are just really sensitive to fluoride, but they might not realize that that's what they're sensitive to. So what are some of the other signs besides skin that somebody might be experiencing an intolerance or a sensitivity to fluoride? Yeah, it's really hard to know because we're just inundated with it from so many different sources. So unless you had that experience that I had, and a lot of people will notice when they travel, their skin changes in yeah. a new environment. And a lot of times that's because of the varying fluoride levels. So even if you go from one fluoridated place to another, like when I was in Delray Beach, Florida, the, the fluoride level was over one part per million, which is very high. It's more than they recommend. And it, my skin was really bad. Whereas when I lived in Virginia, it was 0.6. So it was half of that. I still had acne, but it, it wasn't nearly as bad. So if you notice changes in your skin when you travel, it's a really good sign that it could be fluoride. Um, dental fluorosis is another sign. It's, um, it's a, like a slight discoloring of your teeth, your tooth enamel. It could be like bright white spots or kind of like an opaqueness around the edge of your teeth. So if you have dental fluorosis, um, and your dentist can tell you if you're not sure, um, that's a good indicator that you're sensitive to fluoride because when your teeth were forming, you were exposed to too much fluoride and it accumulated in your body. Um, and the rates of dental fluorosis have skyrocketed. Um, in the 80s, they did a survey and it was like, 20 some percent of adolescents had dental fluorosis and they redid it uh, 20 years later, like in 2004, I think. And, um, and it was over 40% of adolescents wow. had dental fluorosis. So there's a lot of people um, getting too much fluoride. And I, I, w I go into a few more um, things in the book, but like things like thyroid issues are correlated with fluoride toxicity. So if you've ever been diagnosed with hypothyroidism, now that's a good sign that, you know, that, that could be caused by fluoride. Um, depression. A lot of people with acne, myself included, suffer from depression. And the common thinking is like, oh, you're sad because your skin looks bad. <laughs> but that is not it. It is much more complicated than that. And yeah. because fluoride is a depressant. So, um, so depression is another sign, you know, that your acne could be systemic, like that's, a systemic problem, not just yeah. a skin problem. No, that's remarkable. And I, I can say from my perspective, and I'm sure our listeners will agree that acne is always systemic. It really yes, truly yes. is. And, you know, thyroid disease is on the rise. Mental health issues are on the rise. 
And acne in general is on the rise. And we're seeing it not just in populations that typically would have acne, which are your teenagers. And then right. again, you might see it in pregnancy. And then sometimes you see it again later with menopause. Um, but we are just seeing it across all populations at an increased level where it quote unquote doesn't make sense. And right. when we have something like that, when there's a condition that we feel like we're doing everything we're supposed to be doing, it, it's really important to think of these things that you might not normally think of, which is why I'm so glad you're spreading awareness about this because I've been in, in skincare, gosh, gosh, in, in uh, different capacities since I was 17 years old. And I too struggled with acne and um, it took me a while to figure out why, you know, what, what, what did my body need? And of all of the research that I've done both for myself personally and in my professional practice, the link between fluoride and acne is not one that I came across. So it's, you know, this really perked my interest and I would, I would bet that a lot of our listeners, this is new information too. So yeah, it's really not talked about that much. And I thought for a while, I'm like, I discovered the root cause of acne. Like it's new and I figured it out. And then I was reading this book by an allergist from the sixties and he's writing all about it. Like, Oh yeah. Skin eruptions from fluoride is one of the common symptoms. And all these, there's these researchers in Germany who have published papers about it. And I was like, sure, Oh, okay. yeah, it's been around a while. I just didn't know. <laughs> right. And like, but like you said, it's just not what's focused on because right. it's something that Currently, the government is pushing in general. Right. They, they want fluoride in the water. Pediatricians, dentists, they're all pushing the fluoride. And um, as you mentioned, when it comes to research, it, it's not something pharmaceutical that is really something that can be profited from. So it's not saying that, you know, there's something insidious going on. It's just that it's not a priority. So right. when there are people who are struggling, it's it's just important to look at all of these different things and this is a change that is something that you can you can make and it's something within your control which it which right. is good so we talked about the water supply obviously what are some other sources of fluoride that people should be aware of we talked about you know certain foods um you mentioned pesticides i believe so let's let's talk about where else people could find fluoride and avoid it or eliminate it Right. Okay. Well, obviously check your, your dental products. <laughs> That's yeah. the first thing. Switching to a fluoride free toothpaste could be in your mouthwash. Um, when you go to the dentist, those are super high concentrations of fluoride. Right. Um, your water supply, I usually tell people if they can look for um, their water quality report from their local provider, that will tell you exactly how much fluoride's in your water. And I, it, ideally, if you could get it under 0.1, because the, the mean fluoride content of just regular fresh water is 0.05. Okay. Um, so if you get it under 0.1, that's great. Um, you can filter it with reverse osmosis filter. Um, you can, a lot of different spring waters, you can look up their water quality report. Some of them have fluoride naturally. So you want to just double check and make sure that it's low in fluoride. Um, and then once you get your water cleaned up, it's really just a matter of figuring out those few food sources. Um, so anything made with fluoridated water will contain fluoride, like your sodas, or if you're you know drinking like pre-made beverages, um, or even things like mashed potatoes or pasta cooked at a restaurant, if that restaurant is fluoridated, um, you, you'd want to know that if you're really sensitive like me. So I usually look up restaurants in advance, or if I'm not sure, I stick with like salads or something sauteed that I know doesn't have fluoridated water in it. Um, and then the pesticides are a little bit tricky. Um, they're not there's two main fluoride based pesticides and they're not used on a t on everything. So don't like go crazy about it, but the big sources are chicken products. Like I mentioned, because, and it's because the, the fluoride based pesticides are used on their feed and right. they're allowed to have just astronomically high amounts of this fluoride residue on poultry feed. And then when they eat it, it accumulates in their bones. Just like with people, we have fluoride accumulates in our bones for decades and it stays there. Um, and then if you're eating anything made with that, so chicken soup, 
um, with non-organic chickens is very high in fluoride. Um, and it can also be in like the skin or like the gristly bit. So I'm okay eating breast meat if it just, you know, it wasn't cooked on the bone. It's just kind of your basic bland <laughs> white breast meat. Um, but at home, I definitely make sure to buy organic chicken and I don't eat it too much when I go out. Um, and then uh, the other big thing to look out with pesticides is grape products from this mm. one valley in California where they happen to grow half of the world's raisin supplies. Wow. And of course, because of like some weird government rules after World War II that we just ended up like overproducing raisins in this little, in this one area outside of Fresno. It's just like a giant monocrop of raisins and they have to use very harsh pesticides. So every year they're dumping millions of pounds of fluoride on these crops and, um, and they have been found to be very high in fluoride. Not all the time, but sometimes. Um, I have a pretty long section in my book because mm -hmm. I was very curious about um, raisin toxicity in dogs, if it could be fluoride poisoning because of the fluoride. So I, I did an analysis there, and I really do think it is. And I have an interview on um, Dr. Mercola's website and the, the veterinarian side of it talking right. all about raisin toxicosis. And you know, if, if a box of raisins can kill a 100-pound Labrador retriever, um, just be very careful if you're giving, you know, non-organic raisins to, to your children. I did, yeah, no. my goodness. And those little lunch packs and you think, oh, it's a healthy snack. No, maybe exactly. not. And, and wow. we just don't have enough information to know. Um, no one's ever tested for fluoride toxicity in those dogs that are dying. So that's why I did the interview. I'm like, please, someone, next time a dog dies from raisins, check the fluoride levels. Wow. So, um, Definitely be careful with raisins, uh, table grapes from California, and wine. Wine. Um, a lot of wines, more, it's more like the cheaper wines tend to yeah. get their um, grapes from that region. So technically, like Napa and Sonoma don't really use fluoridated pesticides very much, but you, you might want to check with the vineyard there if you're drinking California wines. But anything outside of California is, is probably fine for fluoride. So even Washington State, they don't use these same pesticides. So that's a big one. And then um, the other really popular ones are tea, black tea. And that's not a pesticide thing. It's just because tea happens to uptake fluoride directly from the soil in, in significant amounts. It can be really high in fluoride. So black tea, green tea, white tea, to a lesser right. extent, um, will contain fluoride. And so if you're, you have a tea habit and you're drinking tea every day, it can actually accumulate <laughs> in your bones. Is it black tea? <laughs> It's white tea, but I prefer the best white or green, but it all comes from the same plant. So yeah, it does. Yeah. And it has to do with the age of the leaves, how right. long you keep it for. Um, also, um, like Teflon, you know, if you're making it in like a Teflon pot or something, right. that will increase any nonstick material. Okay. Oh, so the Teflon increases the absorption of the fluoride. Well, Teflon is made of a fluoridated um, chemical. Okay. So um, if, especially if there's like scratches in your Teflon pants, it can leach fluoride into the food. So it can be a significant source of fluoride. Wow. Um, in addition to a whole bunch of other garbage that you just don't want in your body. Right, so right, right. We're, we're not recommending Teflon by any yeah. means here, you guys. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so uh, definitely you can switch to, to tap from Teflon. Um, and then things like cereal, like you wouldn't expect it, but cereal can be made with fluoridated water and it just concentrates the fluoride in the cereal. So I have a cheat sheet on my, um, on my website for this because I know it's like hard to remember all the yeah, different Yeah, and we're going to link to that in the show notes. So yeah, don't worry, you guys. We will give you that yeah. information. Um, okay, so... We're talking a lot about conventional foods. Does that mean that we're safe from this if we are eating organic foods all the time? I mean, I know it's not possible always to eat organic all the time if we're traveling or if we're out at a restaurant, but what about buying organic foods and cooking at home and all of that? That that definitely helps. With okay. So I did see a petition where the um, fluoride ma pesticide manufacturers asked to be allowed to be used on organic crops. Um, they're like, it's a nutrient, it's a mineral. But uh, from what I can tell, it wasn't approved. So they're not allowed oh, right. to use fluoride <laughs> and other fluoride-based pesticides on organic okay. crops. So it is definitely a good option to go organic. With that said, I have seen like a few reports like um, in the California Department of Pesticide Regulations um, database where they'll, where they mentioned, oh yeah, well, you can put fluoride on organic crops. And I called 
to ask them, like, is the rule change? What's going on? And they passed me around to a bunch of different offices. And um, eventually they were like, oh, that's a typo. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, but if you guys think it can be allowed, are you, you know, testing for it? So I, I was a little nervous about that. But I think for the most part, you're safe with organic uh, produce. That's good to know. So yet, yet another reason to go organic. And, you know, yes. with all of this stuff, I just want to encourage people to do the very best you can. We're yes. not able, unfortunately, to protect ourselves from every single toxicant that is in our environment, in our air, in our water. But when you know about something, then it really becomes important to look at what you're doing in your daily life, what you're doing in your uh, place of business. You know, what are things that you can start taking action on to change now just in your own lives? And then, taking it beyond that. If this is a matter that you care about, Melissa, what can people do? How can people start spreading awareness and end the practice of artificial water fluoridation in their communities? Yeah. So there have been a lot of successes at the local level at having fluoride removed because it's very expensive, you know, so your local uh, township is spending a lot of money to add this to the water. So if they hear that you don't want it, they'll actually save money. So it's a lot easier than getting them to spend money on something. Um, so that's, you know, you've got that in your corner and where towns have, um, have, uh, you know, organized and had an organized effort to remove fluoridation, there have been a lot of successes. So you can always just start at your local level, talk to your um, local count, city councils and tell them what you think. And I've heard from so many people who are like, they thanked me because they thought that, you know, they, they, were, they were under this misconception that everybody loved fluoride and that it was completely safe for everyone and they just haven't heard the other side of the story. So we can just talk at the local level. Um, at the national level, I started a petition at change.org. Mm -hmm. um, so the more that we have this local support, um, the more support we'll have to end it at the federal level. And I think that's what really has to happen is the federal government needs to just stop recommending it. And once yeah. they stop recommending it, local towns won't want to add it as much. So to sign that petition, it's at petition.projectfree.me. Um, you type that in your browser, it will redirect you to um, change.org and you can read. Um, it has a lot of the scientific articles there that I, um, that I referenced. Excellent. So we have a whole list of links that we're going to put in the show notes and in the blog post for you guys so that you can check out that petition, but also check out um, Melissa's website and the books. I want you to get the books. I want you, especially if you have a child with fluoride, with fluoride, with acne, um, you know, sometimes kids don't always listen to mom or dad. So handing them a book written by an expert who has done really cool research, at least in my family sometimes. <laughs> sometimes can be a little bit more convincing or show them this video. If there's someone who you know who is a really staunch fluoride supporter, show them this video, share this with them, share this with your colleagues because this is a message that I really want to get out, especially to people who are struggling with acne. And as I said earlier, that's more and more people really than ever before. So let's get this information out there. Make sure that you click on over to the blog post. I'm going to put the link there for you in the show notes as well. And um, that way you can share from there. You can share from the YouTube channel, from iTunes, and also social media. So Melissa, thank you so much, first of all, for being here with us today. And thank you for doing the work that you do and for really standing up and being prepared and doing the work and spreading awareness. It's so important. Thank you. And thank you. I was really excited to um, have the opportunity to speak to estheticians yeah. because they were the ones that really helped me and encouraged me to look for a deeper answer. I'd go to the doctor and they'd say, here's a pill or take a multivitamin. But the estheticians were the ones that were like, what are you eating? You know, what right. are you drinking? And it was, it was really, and they were very encouraging on the whole journey. So like, I love them and I am really excited that more of them will know about the fluoride connection and be able to suggest it to their clients. Fantastic. Well, we will make sure that we get this out to them and that they will get it out to their clients because that is what we do. And I can't wait to see you again at another event. And I will be following what you're doing. And I'm signing that petition as soon as we get off this call today. So thank you again, Melissa. Thank you.